and welcome to this episode of Macros Roundtable, the show where we go in-depth with some of the brightest minds from the worlds of economics and ecology. Macrodose Roundtables are an opportunity to expand on some of the ideas introduced in our short, sharp, 15-minute roundups and longer-form, multi-guest format. On today's episode, we're focusing in on the economics of the green energy transition, asking how can we finance it and what's stopping us? To chat about this, I'm joined by two excellent guests. Brett Christophers is Professor of Human Geography at Uppsala University's Institute for Housing and Urban Research. And his latest book, The Price is Wrong, Why Capitalism Won't Save the Planet, is a tour de force on capital's relationship to the climate. You can buy that now from Verso Books. Adrian Buller is Director of Research at the London-based think tank Commonwealth and author of the fascinating book, The Value of a Whale, On the Illusions of Green Capitalism, which examines the fatal biases that have shaped institutional responses to climate breakdown. Together, we talked about market failures, maladaptation, and the future of economics, growth or degrowth. So first question. Um, first, both books are clear in their opposition to the idea that capitalism can save the planet in Brett's subtitle, even in its supposedly green variant, as Adrian suggests. Um, capitalism is now a much used word, particularly by its opponents, although Actually, Karl Marx, I think, never actually used it himself. It's a, it's a more recent invention. But a working definition of what we mean by capitalism can be a bit hard to pin down. So to both of you, really, to get started, what do you actually mean by capitalism and what's so bad about it? Whoever wants to take that first can jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think it can be a bit of a precocious term, given how often we use it. But I think, um, and I think, you know, Brett and I probably share this point, I know, because I've recently read his book. So we are broadly in alignment here, which is, I think, if you distill it down, there's really only two kind of core elements to capitalism, one of which is private ownership, particularly the means of production. And, and then the other is sort of economic activity motivated by the kind of profit imperative. And I guess there's lots of other features you could identify with capitalism as we know it, you know, markets in which, you know, actors are mediated by the price signal and, and those kinds of features. But ultimately, I think it's really those two essential elements that kind of guide economic activity within a capitalist system. And Brett, I'm guessing yeah. you're broad agreement. But... <laughs> no, 100%. I guess the only two other things that people might typically want to see added, which I think were worth adding, would be that production is not only for the profit motive but is is through wage labor i mean that would be that would be one other thing and the fact and the fact that the, the markets that adrian referred to that essentially there's kind of this imp imperative un under capitalism that anything and everything is reduced to the commodity form to be exchanged in markets as adrian said mediated by the price signal so i think that that's a, pr a pretty decent working definition uh, I would suggest. Um, I mean, the, the the question about kind of what's so bad about it. Um, I think that any any my own view is that any kind of reasonable commentator on capitalism would would always um, accept that you get good with bad. You you get um, you know you get an extraordinary uh, degree of of productive progress historically you know even you know you mentioned Marx even Marx kind of himself marveled at, at the kind of productivity that you had with early industrial capitalism and that you had a you know a degree of um you know just just extreme sort of um activity and inventivity invent inventiveness uh, and so on that you hadn't seen previously and that's obviously had a, a hugely or at least aspects of the, have that have been hugely beneficial for society. But then, then I guess people would say, look, there's a flip side to that in terms of things like labor exploitation, you know, alienation from what we produce, a whole series of other critiques there. And of course, people like Adrian in, in recent years have added to that, that, you know, there's a whole series of environmental issues that we also seem to get as, as part of the bargain, which may or may not be just about capitalism, but they're certainly part of capitalism. I mean, just picking up on that, I mean, is it is it capitalism as such that's, that is the problem here? It's um, another word that's become fashionable in the last decade or 15 years or so uh, is neoliberalism. And, and from your descriptions, what you're describing, if you have a society that's or an economy that's organized by markets, um, where there's a great deal of private ownership, 
of the means of production, of the things you use to produce things, then potentially what you're describing isn't necessarily capitalism, or at least the problem isn't necessarily capitalism. It could be described as neoliberalism, which is, you know, privatise everything, let a market rip, uh, the kind of economic governance we've had really in, in Britain and other places the last 40 years or so. But would you identify the issue as capitalism or neoliberalism in that sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, it seems to me that there's now a, a great degree, I suppose, of um, consensus among, at least among people working on ec- economic questions broadly from the left, I suppose, who would argue that, look, let's, let's not beat around the bush here. It's fairly clear that the direction in which the global capitalist system has been heading over the past 30 or 40 years, which is the period which, as you say, is generally referred to as a kind of a neoliberal capitalist regime it is in many different respects more problematic than the, the than the kind of post-war decades the three or four post-war decades uh in all sorts of different ways in terms of you know levels of equality inequality of income and wealth um all, all sorts of other things i guess where the, the questions start arising is you know What's the kind of capitalist norm? Was the was that brief pre you know post war period? You know, I think a lot of us, myself included, kind of growing up thinking about that as the norm and what's happened since as the kind of um, departure from the norm. But I think if you look over a, bro- a broader durée, you know, arguably it's that post war period that was the exception to the norm, and that what we've had before and since, whether it is kind of traditional liberal capitalism or modern neoliberal capitalism, which is which is the norm. Which is a which, if you think of it that way, is a bit you know becomes a bit more sobering and a bit more depressing in many ways. Um, so I think that's you know a long-winded way of saying it, it, it's pretty clear to me at least that the direction we are heading in have been heading in, which is kind of you know towards a you know a much more kind of American-style brutalistic, um, very unequal capitalism. It, it, it is is worse from from many different respects. I mean, picking up on that, I suppose it's it's um, what we both identify is um, the 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 issues we're up against around what's happening with with climate change, what's happening with the environment is is bigger than the the usual concept of market failure. I think you both sort of pick up in different ways on on this. Um, and market failure is often a bit misunderstood, or at least it has been in the past. That if you have someone like um, Nicholas Stern, now Lord Stern who wrote in 2006 this compendious report for the then Labour government on the economics of climate change and and really sort of mainstreamed a great chunk of climate change economics in that sense, described climate change as the greatest market failure the world has ever seen, which often gets heard as quite a radical thing. It's like markets are failing, this is bad. Actually, what the mainstream is talking about here is that markets are failing because there isn't a market there. And, And I think both of you have quite a different take in this. Uh, I think, Adrian, I, I want to turn to you here and perhaps pose a question. What is it that the mainstream concept of market failure fails to grasp about the issues posed by climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think it helps probably to define first what it really means, which in this case, I think it tends to be used to describe the fact that, particularly around carbon emissions, because we don't price them in broadly um, to, to the market, the market and actors within it uh, aren't able or equipped to kind of deal with that phenomenon, right? So as Brett said at the beginning, you know, to arbitrate within markets, you require a price for exchange and to kind of allocate resources. And we talk about market failure often in the case of the climate crisis. What people are describing there is our failure to price in carbon emissions, therefore leaving them external to the market. Um, And I think the trouble that you run into there is that that necessarily implies that we can resolve that issue by internalizing carbon to the market through applying a carbon price, which is kind of the be all and end all of orthodox climate policy. Um, And I think what a lot of economists tend to advocate for have been advocating for for decades, um, with the idea being that if you can kind of get the price right and and bring carbon emissions into the market in that way, that market actors will then, you know, thanks to the fact that they're motivated to maximize profits, will kind of just quickly and efficiently uh, find ways to eliminate carbon from economic activity. And, you know, the problem kind of can be solved in a cost-effective way without the kind of uh, sort of 
regulation and kind of like heavy state intervention that tends to be sort of ideologically opposed, I think, by a lot of policymakers, at least in, in the U.S., where this has really dominated or had dominated the conversation up until the Inflation Reduction Act passed by the Biden administration. I think prior to that point, uh, passing some kind of carbon trading mechanism was kind of the be all and end all. And it's the same in, in Europe and the UK, where it's kind of always been a major point of conversation. Um, and there are lots of reasons I think that that is a bit of a non-starter in terms of an approach to addressing the climate crisis. Um, that probably could be a whole episode in and of itself, but I'm happy to dive into some of that if you like. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at the simplest level, one of the one of the biggest issues with carbon pricing in particular is that you know if you take it at face value the idea is that we need to have a single carbon price per unit of of carbon emitted um kind of universally across the global economy that's the ideal in the economic sense and even taking that as a starting point um without looking at any other kind of critiques it's been you know profoundly difficult not only to agree in a theoretical sense on what a meaningful and effective carbon price should be, you know, estimates range from like $20 to upwards of 14,000 per unit from what I've seen. And that's based on all sorts of assumptions about, you know, the extent to which carbon emissions damage the economy, the extent to which we should care about that, the way that you model that damage. Um, and, you know, so even starting from there, no one can really agree theoretically on where it should be let alone kind of implement a carbon price at anything like the scale that most people would agree is, is necessary. So the last estimate I saw was that the average kind of global carbon price, although, you know, it's very patchy in terms of where it's actually been enacted, sits at like just over two pounds per ton. And, you know, the EU, for example, says that it needs to be closer to like 100 pounds per ton by 2030 if we're to align with, you know, the Paris Agreement. And a big part of that is that, you know, it's really hard to design a carbon price that is an incredibly blunt instrument were it to be high enough to be effective in terms of its impact economically on sort of individuals and therefore the kind of political consent that you can sort of garner for it. You know, it's quite unpopular and I think for good reason to kind of apply a uniform kind of blunt tool to you know, what is ultimately an issue that is embedded throughout the entire economy, you know, every aspect of our lives currently, you know, is broadly dependent on fossil fuels from energy to agriculture, everything in between. Um, and so to impose a really high carbon price that would sort of be effective in the view of, of people modeling it um, could be incredibly economically painful, tends to be even at a low level and is therefore sort of a, a political non-starter. And I think there are all sorts of other kind of underlying <laughs> reasons that we could get into, but that's, that's probably a good enough place to start from. And Brett, I mean, I think you, you raised something similar, or at least a similar set of, of issues with what looks like, in terms of talking about renewable generation, a kind of coordination failure, you might call it, if uh, if you're going to put your sort of mainstream economics hat on. The, the nature of renewable technology is that the stuff you are trying to generate, so electricity from wind power is not in the same places where you want to consume it. So, for instance, you have lots of wind in the north of China, but you have lots of electricity demand in southern China. Um, that kind of feels like a coordination problem. You can see the issue here. But it's also one where you might argue that actually there's just an issue of pricing, that you need to price the, the difference in windiness in different places properly, and therefore the market will uh, resolve it all. I mean, what's your objection to seeing some of these coordination problems as really versions of this market failure or a, a kind of problem of not pricing things properly? Yeah, no, that's a good a good point and a good question. Um, I, I suppose I'd say, I'd say th three kind of connected parts to that. I mean, I don't really, I, I don't necessarily object to it. I think it's a limited optic um, that the mainstream typically takes to be the kind of solitary optic um but but i don't think it's an optic that is necessarily always um you know inaccurate or completely misleading i think i think the first thing i would say so so you're right that um you know it's not just a question of china but in fact whichever country you look at in the world that that has a significant that already has a significant renewables capacity dimension to its power generation system you do have this in, in extraordinary mismatch between essentially where people live and where the renewable power tends to be located 
but I think, I, and, and in China, that's, you know, people live in the South and East and the, the, the renewable capacity, not just wind, but also solar tends to be in the North and the West. I think the first thing I would say is that I think it's, so the, the kind of the environmental conditions play a part, but it's actually, I think it's principally not about that. It's principally about cost. So w- one of the things, as, as I'm sure many uh, listeners will know, one of the things about renewable power that's very, very different from conventional power plants is they need a heck of a lot of land. And not surprisingly, land tends to be very, very expensive where most where people live. You know, so the cost of land in Wyoming, for example, is like 1% of the cost of the land in New Jersey or in, or in the area around New York City. Um, so there's an extraordinarily strong economic incentive to locate wind and solar power as far away from where people live as, as, as possible. Um, and so actually, one of, the, one of the points I try to make in the book is that, you know, we, we, we can say and we do say, we more generally, you know, it's very, very cheap now to produce renewable power but it's only cheap uh, or in, in a better way of putting it it's only in, in large part it's cheap precisely because that power tends to be generated with the land the necessary land is cheap but that means that if it's cheap to generate the power it's very very expensive to deliver that power to where it's needed renewables places an extraordinarily high burden on the transmission and distribution system and so you, i guess the way i put it is that you can't have your cake and eat it you can't have cheap costs to generate it and cheap costs to deliver it. You pay somewhere or another. And we've kind of led ourselves into this very kind of narrow way of thinking about it because we focus on generating costs and not the delivery costs. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing, I mean, could you price, could you have a pricing system to incentivize better location, so to speak? Well, I mean, lots of countries try to do that. The UK would be an exception here, right? So as I'm sure uh, most most of your listeners, uh, viewers perhaps located in the UK, um, both in the UK and in many other countries, both in wholesale markets and in retail markets, so both where the retailers of, of electricity buy their power and where households and businesses buy their power, there's a uniform price for electricity nationwide. It's exactly the same price everywhere. But where I live in Sweden... And in parts of the states, and in parts, and in New Zealand, in various other countries, they actually have they actually have regional, um, they have geographically variegated pricing, both in wholesale and retail markets, and the, they do that precisely to try to incentivize the better the better location that you're talking about. So, for example, on a on a on a day when electricity is generally expensive in Sweden, it can be electricity can be twenty times more expensive. In the south of Sweden than in the, than in north of Sweden, there's huge there's huge differences. But what we found is that even in those countries where they try to do that, they still find that um, uh, renewables developers almost exclusively site their um, facilities where land is very cheap and where people don't live. So it seems to be the fact that we've not you know despite trying to do that, it seems to be very difficult to develop a system where you get kind of ideal location without the cost associated with that being too great for consumers and or producers to bear. And the th- and then I think that the third and final thing I would say very, very briefly, and it kind of takes us back to what you were asking earlier about neoliberalism. And there's a, there's a great, um, the, 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 I think it was Philip Morofsky had this fantastic piece that he wrote many years back where he said, you know, what are the, t- the 10 key um, attributes or characteristics of neoliberal thinking. And I think at the top of he, his list, he put, it was like, for neoliberals, um, the market is always the solution to problems introduced by the market in the first place, by which he meant the solu- The problem is never the market. The problem is that we haven't got markets right. So the solution is always like better or purer or deeper markets. And so I, you know, I would just throw that out there as a kind of a caution to that way of thinking. I'm sort of related to that, just coming, coming to you, Adrian, that, that um, related to the idea of, of markets as a sort of abstract uh, calculating machine that always works and, and the, the idea of you know, an economic model is a sort of abstract calculating machine that will tell you what the future is going to be like. There's a really interesting discussion in your book 
about how this this sort of famous two degrees of warming, this target that we're supposed to be aiming for, um, comes out at the back of a thought experiment in a 1975 paper by the economist uh, William Nordhaus. Um, you spent some time on, on the work of William Nordhaus. It forms a bit of a, a running theme throughout the book. I wondered if it might be possible to describe what you think the, the issue is with his research and with mainstream climate economics in general. I mean, for the benefit of listeners and viewers, uh, Nordhaus won the, the so-called Nobel Prize in economics a couple of years ago, maybe even last year, and has argued, as Adrian, you quote him, that good policies must lie somewhere between wrecking the economy and wrecking the world. Yeah, it's a it's a great question and both a fun and a depressing one to kind of dive into. Um, there's quite, I think, a mythology around this kind of origin story of the two degree target, but kind of the first place that it really crops up, as you pointed out, is uh, in a paper uh, from 1975 by Bill Nordhaus, and he basically describes himself in the paper that he's just sort of thinking about loud, thinking out loud rather, about what the right kind of trade-off is between rising temperatures and sort of economic growth. So for him, the economy is really understood in terms of its health through the prism of, of aggregate GDP growth. So just to you know take that as a starting point. And that paper begins from genuinely, I think he uses the phrase, a first intuition. Um, that it seems like two degrees is probably about right, because broadly that's where temperatures have stood for the you know, duration of our time on this planet, um, which is just kind of an amazing <laughs> starting point. Um, how it gets cemented into climate policy, I think you know, that takes place over several decades. But I think, um, I think his work for me, although he's by no means entirely unique in taking this approach, you know, there's a whole field of kind of climate economics that he's really kind of the, the figurehead of. Um, is fascinating to me in, in its approach, as you pointed out there, to the way that it kind of simplifies climate and ecological crisis into economic models to really understand, you know, what should our policy approach be to these crises from the perspective of its interplay with, with the economy. Um, and for anyone who's interested in this, I mean, there's a brilliant kind of takedown by uh, Professor Steve Keen um, from Australia, and so highly recommend looking up that paper. Um, but, you know, just as some examples, I think, you know, generally what they're trying to do from the outset is, is set themselves a kind of impossible task, right? Because, I mean, even climate scientists would be the first to tell you that our understanding of how, you know, global heating will actually play out at a climate and global level is relatively poor only because it's a phenomenally complex system with all sorts of uncertainties that we can't capture very well in climate models. And yet economists have taken the step further to smooth those complex models into trying to arrive at an estimate of how that will affect the economy in this kind of single GDP figure. So from the outset, it's kind of an amazing undertaking. And there's a great uh, sort of survey that Nordhaus does early on in his efforts to try and kind of develop and, and sort of iterate these models. And what he does is reaches out to loads of economists and loads of climate scientists. And the result is that, you know, the climate scientists estimates of how different kind of increases in global temperature will impact the economy are something like 20 to 30 times greater than the estimates from the economists, who it really seems are just kind of doing vibes-based estimates at this point in time. Um, and, you know, that's kind of funny to laugh about, but these are the kinds of materials that have fed in, you know, along with loads of other evidence to the modeling that Nordhaus is now kind of famous for and for which he did win this kind of Nobel Prize in economics, such as it is, um, which is what's called the DICE model. And it does what we've been talking about. So try to integrate the way that a change in climate will impact the economy. Um, and it's just this kind of machine for abstracting the complexity of, of the climate and ecological system into its impact on the economy. Um, you know, it's good at modeling and, you know, Nordhaus himself admits this. It's, it's good at modeling things like, you know, smoothly rising global average temperatures or smoothly rising global average sea level. Um, but the problem is, you know, from the perspective of actual change in climate and its impacts, those aren't really useful or particularly meaningful measures, right? You know, just because the global average temperature is rising by a certain amount does not mean in any way that that plays out evenly over the planet, that it plays out evenly on land versus the oceans, for example. Um, and they can't take into account things like tipping points. Um, there is a kind of reduction of ecological crisis, biodiversity loss. All these things just kind of aren't really taken to account in the models because those things are difficult to model. 
And so you arrive at estimates, I think, you know, Nordhaus's most recent estimate is that from an economic perspective, the optimal, you know, global temperature rise is, is three or three and a half degrees Celsius, <laughs> whereas science would tell you that that's, that's kind of <laughs> a nonsensical, potentially catastrophic outcome. And that really comes from when you try to force the complexity of this issue into an incredibly narrow prism of its impact on GDP, itself, you know, an intensely problematic indicator, which I think isn't a particularly controversial thing to say at this stage. Um, and so that, I think, kind of cap encapsulates that field as a whole and is something that I think sounds maybe fringe or a bit silly, but is actually incredibly central to the way that policymakers think about this crisis. You know, these kinds of models are integral to different scenarios in, you know, the IPCC. Um, and so it's something that we do really have to, I think, take seriously, um, as funny as it kind of can be at times. You know, I think one of his first models for this, Nordhaus excludes something like 90% of the economy from his GDP calculation because it takes place inside, effectively. So finance, manufacturing, mining in the initial setting, all of these things won't be impacted by climate change because they basically take place in air conditioning. <laughs> so, you know, some of that has since been revised, but nonetheless, those assumptions still kind of feed into the way that we understand climate and its relationship to the economy. Well, it does. I mean, look, it does sound somewhat peculiar at best when you start to spell it out that, that you can have an optimal rate of global temperature increase. Right? This is a pretty wild idea if you think about it, but it, it's completely consistent with how the mainstream neoclassical economics works. That everything is basically a question of what trade-offs can you make, and the assumption underlying everything is that there is always some trade-off you can make. There is some adjustment you can make at the margin that gives you a little bit more here and a little bit less there. And if we have a model that captures climate change in the economy, we can just kind of tweak it and arrive at this sort of basically ludicrous idea that there is some point that is optimally the economy is still growing and it has some cost and climate change but not so much that we damage economic growth too much I mean it's just completely sort of crazy stuff and, and I think it's it's finally sort of sinking in not least because we are actually having to deal with like a whole load of non-linearities in various different ways that this isn't actually a very smart way to, to think about what's going to happen over the next few decades um just related or somewhat related to that I suppose it's, it's uh, back to Brett and picking up on another um Something you zero in on as a as a driving force in capitalism, which is the the role of profit in determining what investment happens where uh, and when. Um, you note that renewables, which have you know thin margins, as we've talked about, uh, specific demands about where they have to be located, they're not necessarily very well suited to capitalist investment, to profit seeking investment. Um, people might have seen the recent problems at various renewables manufacturers. Uh, thinking Orsted here, the Danish uh, wind turbine manufacturer, has run into. Um, but I'm just wondering if there wouldn't be a sort of reasonable economic argument you could make that the problem isn't the profits, the problem isn't the system of profit making as giving incentive as to where you invest, but actually it might be the technology itself that you might be able to say, okay, maybe these technologies we have just aren't good enough and there's going to be something better elsewhere that we could find and why don't we go and do that instead? The, the problem isn't the system, the problem is that we've not invented the right things yet. Um, yeah, so so you're you're right. I mean, before um, trying to answer that question, just to expand a wee bit on yeah, the the kind of the essence of the argument I make, which is you're right. So the the kind of intervention that I'm trying to make is to say, um, so what I'm not doing in in the book is saying you know all, all other explanations, including from from others on the left, about why. The existing economic system is, is is proving a problematic one in terms of dealing with 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 climate change. It's not to say they're wrong. It's to say, look, I think there's also another explanation that is, in fact, quite complementary with a lot of the existing explanations, and and that one we actually haven't given enough attention to. And so I'm not saying you know the problem's not about economic coordination or things like that. I think you know problems of coordination are very very important. But I'm saying, look, there's also this problem of kind of inherently relatively low profitability in renewables oh. and why is that a pro why is that a problem well that's a problem because if you look around the world essentially every country around the world for the most part i mean there are exceptions that uh, china would be one that we can we can come back to later maybe but pretty much everywhere else in the world what governments have done is they've said look we are it's up to you they're basically saying it's up to it's up to private firms to develop solar and wind power to substitute for fossil fuel-based uh, power generation. 
And and so therefore it comes down principally to the profit motive. And that doesn't mean the governments play no role at all. Of course, they they do play a role, but their role is not to do, has not been generally to develop and operate uh, solar and wind farms themselves. It's been to kind of nudge the private sector in the right direction through various forms of incentives where the private sector is not doing it. Uh, itself and so if if you have a system that is an approach sorry that is essentially about leaving it up to the private sector and markets but the thing that kind of guides the private sector which is profitability is not kind of particularly attractive then you have a problem and that's basically the argument i'm making in the book in in a in a nutshell what i mean i guess what i would i would say two things i don't think it's specifically a question of the technology although the, the the nature of the technology is certainly a part of this i would i would put it in two two other different ways so the first thing i would say is it's less about the technology than about the relations of production by which i mean like under what industrial and commercial conditions are these uh technologies being um developed and installed and operated. And I'll, and I'll emphasize here that the, the, the focus that I have and the focus of the book is not on the manufacture of the technology. It's on the business of developing the, the, the facilities, you know, installing the wind turbines, the solar modules. And then even more than that, it's about the business of, um, of selling the electricity that that facility will generate over the 25 or 35 or 30 years of its life or whatever it might be. And I think the problem here is it is that it's about the relationship of production. You have, you're selling what in the form of electricity is essentially an undifferentiated commodity. Uh, and, and as we know, markets for those types of commodities are very, very prone to price competition. You have a system of commercialization where developers have, um, very, very little market power to, to speak of. There are very, very low barriers to entry. And when you have industries and markets like that, you tend to get depressed profitability. Um, you know, any any economist of any persuasion on uh, either on the mainstream side or the heterodox side will tell you that, you know, the most reliable attribute to have in terms of generating consistently high profitability is some form of oligopoly or market or, or monopoly power of some kind and that just doesn't exist in electricity commercialization and you know oil and gas would be a great counterpoint there where basically you have opec which is nothing if not a cartel that enables the um uh, to keep prices and profits up globally you know, if there's if there's a price problem, then you just cut back on supply. Well, electricity doesn't have an, doesn't have an OPEC, so there's a real problem with the, the relations of production. I would say the second thing I would say is only to add to that is that, and I think it's very very important, is that government mechanisms for supporting renewables development in most places in the world oddly tend to kind of exacerbate that price competition rather than doing anything to alleviate it. And I think the problem here is that, you know, governments have got themselves into a real bind, I think, where they've where they've sort of bought into that, essentially a myth that renewables are very, very cheap. And they've said to the public, you know, Ed Miliband and his team have done this for the last couple of years in the UK. They said, look, we're going to deliver, you know, reams and reams of renewable power incredibly cheaply because it's incredibly cheap to produce. And they said, well, no, that's, that's just not true. But if you tell people that, then you become uh, beholden to market mechani- to mechanisms of, of incentivization, whereby you not only alleviate, don't alleviate, but you exacerbate that price competition. And the way that happens in the UK and most other places in Europe is that you award contracts through reverse auctions where developers bid prices down to the lowest possible price at which they'll be able to generate any margins at all. And as, and as we saw in the UK last year, you know, if that goes too far, you get to the point where there's no bids at all because there's simply, if you if the government imposes a price ceiling, which is what it did in the UK case, then there's simply no profits to be made there and no one bids for the contract. So I think the government, it's it's the relations of production as as exacerbated by the systems of government incentivization that typically exist. I want to stay with this a bit because it, it touches on something that, that was mentioned earlier, which is is the question not just of um how markets operate but also the, the kind of institutions that, that also might influence economic outcomes 
I mean, if we take Austria, for example, I think it's still, it is still uh, majority owned by the Danish government, right? So this is a somewhat not privately owned. This is a state-owned company in its majority, but it's behaving entirely on the sort of market incentive, profit-seeking um, basis. Brett, you also mentioned China, which you, you might want to talk about and the approach of the government there uh, varying. I suppose it's a rather broad question about, well, look, if if... if if even if the government takes ownership, majority ownership of a big manufacturer, you still in, run into these uh, problems. Presumably, just saying we will have public ownership isn't the solution to, to this. I mean, often, you know, particularly on the left, you sit there and say, well, if your government owned it, it would just be much better, wouldn't it? And it's like, clearly, this isn't enough. So what are the sorts of institutions and mechanisms we could be thinking about that would get us out, would start to deliver a better outcome uh, in terms of decarbonisation in particular? I mean, that's a, again, that's a it's a it's a great question, and and um, you know, my starting point is is um, not sort of energy or climate specific. My starting point would to say that you know I don't think it's necessarily helpful to kind of um, sort of um, unequivocally romanticise public ownership any more than it's helpful to kind of unequivocally demonise private ownership. You can have very decent forms of private ownership that work well, just as you can have, you know, shocking forms of private ownership, like private ownership of electricity and water in the UK case. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember British Rail. Um, you can have shockingly shocking forms of public ownership and custodianship of important um, infrastructure assets, just as you can have very, very good ones. And what I think, what I would, you know, the only thing I would add to that is to say that I think at least... The, the key thing is that at least with public ownership, you at least have the possibility of different outcomes that you essentially foreclose in many cases with private ownership, by which I mean outcomes that are primarily primarily attuned to public benefits of various kinds. But of course, public ownership in and of itself doesn't deliver that. You know, one of my favorite ever, you know, I'm a geographer, one of my favorite ever writers with the geography was the late Doreen Massey. And she used, she did this great work on land ownership in the late 1970s in the UK. And the point she always made about it was like, well, public ownership of land in and of itself is worthless unless you enable those public sector owners of the land to behave like something other than private owners. So if you have public ownership, but you expect public owners of wind farms as much as land to just behave in the same way that we expect private owners but then there's no point you have to enable them to behave differently now so and i and i think that's completely true in the energy context and the electricity context and i think china is a is a you know is a fact what's going on in china here is a brilliant example that you know a lot of people won't want to hear because um for all sorts of very good reasons you know the nature of the, the chinese regime but put it this way so you, you, some of your listeners, viewers might have heard in, in the last couple of months, all sorts of excitement about the fact that the world installed 50% more renewables capacity, solar and wind capacity in 2023 than in 2022. So there's a you know, huge hoo-ha saying, oh, we're now we're making enormous progress. We're getting the growth we need. Well, something like 80 to 90% of that growth in 2023 was delivered by China. And so, and so what, and so, and actually the IEA, the International Energy Agency has immediately kind of upgraded its forecast. And again, there was this great excitement about it. 90% of the increase that it added to its previous forecast for the next five years was China. So essentially it's all about China. The rest of the world is just completely standing still on renewables right now. Well, what's different in China? Well, first of all, 95% of renewables development ownership in China is by state-owned companies, which is the exact, literally the exact opposite of the West, where 95% of renewables development ownership is by private sector firms. So you have the exact opposite. But the other thing, of course, is that in China, those state-owned companies, are, you know, the profit motive absolutely plays a part in the operations of those companies, but it doesn't play the decisive part. And, and so when Beijing says it wants to build new, you know, 300 gigawatt energy bases in the Gobi Desert and the other deserts over the next seven years, which will be more renewables capacity than the whole of Europe currently has, then Beijing just does it. And it does it through its state-owned companies and, and it gets financed through its state-owned banks. And it's just, that's just gotten very, very, very little to do with the profit motive. And so the, the point is that 
the one place in the world that right now is kind of pushing ahead very, very rapidly at a speed that's required is the one place where all of this is not dictated by the profit motive. And so, yes, it's it, and, and yes, it's publicly owned entities there, but they're publicly owned entities where um, something other than the profit motive is is primarily going is primarily going on. So that I, I guess that's where I would come back to about all this is like, well, yes, I personally tend to believe that faster progress in the rest of the world is only really likely to happen with a greater degree of public control and ownership. But it's but it has to be a particular type of public control and ownership. I think it's like a good place to bring uh, Adrian in and talk about perhaps the, the kinds of public ownership that, that might work there. And in, in the absence of you know living in China and having the Chinese Communist Party to tell <laughs> state-owned enterprises what to do, what, what would be the the sort of institutional forms that might work if we if we had something better than what we had here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Brett has has touched upon like the core element there that I think is really integral to effective public ownership, which is that, you know, it can't just be publicly owned, like in the case of Orsted, and yet operating within, you know, a, a market that is motivated by the exact same kind of motivations that private sector actors are. It's Orsted is effectively expected to act in the same way that, that a private firm would be, right? And so that, I think, is not the kind of institutional form of uh, a kind of publicly owned energy company that I think would resolve some of these underlying tensions. And you know, it's on that front that I actually think in the UK case, you know, there are some kind of red flags to be raised over the proposal that we currently have from the Labour Party, for example, around Great British Energy, because effectively, you know, that's the proposal that's that's on offer, right? And it's, it, you know, overtly marketed as a way for, you know, the great British public to to benefit from, you know, the profits of, of renewable energy, which, as Brett points out, are, you know, broadly, actually not really there unless they're heavily subsidized by the public sector. And so I think we're we remain kind of mired in this rhetorical and ideological positioning around the superiority of sort of private sector coordination and markets for all things. You know, that, as Brett pointed out, I think can be the case in some areas, but it needs to be an approach to the governance and distribution of this resource that is fundamentally different from that approach and from that set of imperatives. And, and you can think about things like, you know, I don't know, the justice system or, or the NHS or other things that we provide where, you know, our first and foremost priority is not have we done this profitably and with, you know, the greatest cost efficiency, although it's worth saying that, you know, marketization and things like the NHS and education, you know, is underway and has negatively in many cases impacted the actual outcomes we want to see. So for me, energy should be treated as something that, you know, should be liberated in some ways from that narrow demand for profitability because it simply has to be right. It just doesn't really adhere to the kind of maxims of a functioning commodity within a market. And so public ownership at the very least needs to not be based around those principles. And I think as well, you know, there are all sorts of diverse layers of a kind of ownership model freed from the profit motive that can work. So there's a lot of great work done around sort of community energy or other forms of municipally owned energy, et cetera. And those are great. And I think really interesting examples to start from as a sort of prefigurative model. But at the end of the day, and Brett's book does a brilliant job of capturing this, you know, the scale of this problem means that we are looking at something much bigger than that in terms of decarbonizing the global electricity system. And so finding a way for a kind of state level public ownership model to be oriented around something other than profit maximization, because it has to be, and sort of much more democratically accountable, I think, um, is a really necessary starting point. I would just sort of, it's kind of following on from that, I suppose, but it's something, Adrian, that, that you flag uh, in, in your book uh, from the IPCC's latest report on maladapt maladaptation, excuse me, um, which is the idea that things we do in response to climate change could, quote, lead to increased risk of adverse climate-related outcomes, including via increased greenhouse gas emissions, increase or shifted vulnerability to climate change, more inequitable outcomes, or diminish welfare now or in the future, which by the way, sounds completely comprehensive uh, as a list of things that, that could go wrong. But essentially, it's a kind of law of unintended consequences that you attribute to green capitalism. 
uh, in particular. So there's a classic example here directly related to decarbonisation, the scale of decarbonisation, which is this push to restart uh, deep sea strip mining for rare earth minerals in particular. So there's some desperate, really understandably desperate, small island states that are keen on getting this started because it means that they can go and use what appears to be the wealth uh, in the seabed around them uh, as part of a decarbonisation programme, which you need very rapidly if you're a small island state because you won't exist in a few years' time. But I wanted to ask in particular that isn't that issue of maladaptation that you write down to green capitalism, isn't there kind of a danger that this can form a part of any action on the climate, including actually major sort of state-led Green New Deal type programmes? I mean, all you need is an omniscient and omnipotent global state actor. And the pro- no, of course, of course, you know, our systems are inherently as fallible as we are and, and no system or institution is exempt from that. I think the point about maladaptation that I try to make in the book, and I think, you know, it's such an interesting kind of quietly made note in, in that recent IPCC report, is that in my view, and I think for a lot of the reasons we've just talked about with, with Brett's discussion of renewable energy being a really good example, you know, what we're doing is broadly guaranteeing maladaptation in all of these kind of instances by forcing the myriad and very complex problems, whether it's, you know, cutting carbon emissions or biodiversity loss or all sorts of other ecological questions through the incredibly and impossibly narrow prism of, of the market. And I think in doing so, you end up guaranteeing all sorts of kind of negative outcomes from the get-go that then subsequently as well are broadly kind of left unaccountable in terms of, you know, who's picking up the tab because the nature of markets is to kind of diffuse responsibility for actions, right? So, you know, that was a bit abstract, but like the renewable energy example, I think is a really good one, right? So Brett, you talk about in your book how, you know, electricity is this kind of fictitious commodity, right? It's something that isn't inherently produced as a commodity, produced for the market, and therefore our ability to try and treat it as such leads us down this kind of rabbit hole of constantly needing to adjust and fix the market and try to force it into something that it isn't. And that, I think, is the case in so many instances of of the kind of climate policy that we see being pursued in all sorts of other areas. So, you know, a basic example might be, you know, trying, we've talked about carbon pricing, you know, trying to force the creation of carbon markets, right? So markets and carbon credits. What that's done is create this enormous proliferation of, you know, carbon offsetting regimes around the world in order to kind of lubricate those markets and create the most kind of cost effective form or the easiest form from the perspective of private firms of, you know, cutting carbon. Because if you're treating all of this as equivalent, it's much easier to say, I'm going to pay XYZ Nature Conservancy or other NGO to give me a credit for, you know, a forest that burned down in 2018, actual credits that have been sold for forests that have already burned down in forest fires. It's much easier to do that than it is if I'm Chevron to actually find a way to broadly make my business model obsolete, right? (laughs) And so that, I think, is the kind of illogical end and maladaptive end that you result in when you try to wedge things into a market framework that, you know, shouldn't be so. And the same goes for, and this is something I talk about a lot, which is, um, you know, carbon emissions are one thing. At least you know what a unit of CO2 is. (laughs) What we're doing on the ecological side is also try to kind of disaggregate the complexity of ecosystems into market compliant units like, I mean, the title of my book is The Value of a Whale, which renders from a study that tries to do that for whales, but that's a bit more on the extreme end. I think, you know, something much more common is the idea of, you know, ecosystem services, for example, which is those things that nature currently provides to us for free, like breathable air and clean water and pollination and all of these excellent services. And trying to disaggregate those into units that actors can then trade in order to kind of protect and produce more of those services. And what you see when, I mean, very few studies of this exist because these systems are relatively new in terms of operating at scale, but the kind of evidence that we do have of their efficacy is that, you know, it tends to be catastrophic, you know, trying to offset the harms that you do to biodiversity in one place by paying to protect a wetland somewhere else is kind of just an ecological non-equivalence, even if the market treats those things as equivalent. Um, And so I think that is really what I get at in terms of why I think green capitalism 
as it stands, is uniquely prone to maladaptation because where we're at is this arms race of forcing things to function in markets that I think can never do so. I'm just picking up on that. And by the way, I think Tesla make the majority of their profits or any profit at all from selling carbon credits by this point, don't they? Right? It's not actually from that. the cars, which is <laughs> something, something of a lost leader for them. It's from the selling and trading carbon credits. So they get a great chunk of their actual uh, worth out of when it's not you know, just Bitcoin trading, whatever it do, was a couple so of years ago. Do they sell those credits under the idea that someone has bought a Tesla and not a conventional car and therefore that's I, I believe offset. that's the case yeah yeah so it's an offset Phenomenal. if you've got yeah i know so so you, you're kind of offset <laughs> what it would have been if you'd gone and bought something that burns petrol and therefore you sell that to some company that's actually just doing a whole load of environmental damage somewhere else and this all mm. works out perfectly in some <laughs> cosmic sense but uh, i wanted to pick up on on that that specific thing about pricing and the pricing not just of we talked a lot about carbon but of course your, your book deals with wider issues uh the way in which for a long period of time the kind of the mainstream, the environmental movement, the, the sort of the very respectable NGOs, the, the, that kind of end of things would talk about this being quite a neat way to win environmental goals. So if you could demonstrate that the value of this forest or this, this particular ecosystem or this biodiversity actually had the dollar sign you could put at the top end of it, this would start to convince people it was actually really worth something. And it seems to produce a, a really perverse consequence of this which is actually all you've done is then start to convince people, well, in that case, why don't we try and sell the thing? Why don't we find a way to actually uh, market that? The, the, the sort of eco-modernist market-led solution, put a price and everything, has is, is produced this series of perverse consequences all over the place. But it does open up a, a bigger question, which is kind of, if it's not the market, what do you do instead? Well, so right now, okay, I uh, this is going to be a, uh, a very kind of partial and very inadequate uh, answer to your question, but it seems to me that um, specifically in terms of um, renewables and um, you know decarbonizing the power sector, which which for all sorts of different reasons, not least the the, the fact that we're kind of put, putting so many eggs in the basket of electrification, is 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 so incredibly important. It, it seems to me that that there will have to be one of three different routes or perhaps a different perhaps a combination of them um if there's going to be a kind of a hastening uh that we need of the the, the shift from fossil fuels to renewables uh in that area so so one would be to say would be kind of um I, i'm hesitant here given your, your reference earlier to the communist party but some form of kind of the china solution which is just a much more kind of hands-on um state role um so you know public ownership but but, but public ownership in a, of, of a particular guise so that the second one would be to say okay look we are, we're just going to accept that we're going to stick with the private sector-led solution but we're also going to accept that profitability and expected profitability is a real is a real problem here and we're just going to accept that therefore we're going to have to the state is going to have to provide the necessary incentives to to speed things up on the private sector side, which I guess you could argue is kind of what the Inflation Reduction Act is in the US context, where the tax credits that had been supplied to, to renewables develop historically had been, um, the rate of tax credit had been declining over time. There was this assumption that you could reduce the tax credits as the cost of the technologies came down and private sector investment would remain healthy. But that, that didn't occur for all the reasons I try and lay out in the book. And Biden, it, 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 what, what the Inflation Reduction Act essentially does is say, OK, we'll just accept that we have to re, re, return those credits to the original 30% maximum rate and hope that the private sector uh, then does the job. Whether that, whether that is true or not is a, is a different question. But you're, what you're basically saying there is we will provide the necessary incentives, we'll keep profitability as high as it needs to be, essentially. We'll massage private sector profitability to the extent required. And, and look, if, if someone gives me the personal choice of like, you know, if the choice is between um, decarbonisation proceeding rapidly and BlackRock and co making shitload of profit or BlackRock and co not making profit and decarbonization not occurring i'll take the first one every day of the week if that's if that's the choice but i don't think that necessarily is the choice so that's the second thing the third thing and this goes back to one of your earlier questions james which is to say 
you know, the mainstream solution would be to say, well, we just haven't got markets right. And so there'll be, you know, lots of lots of people, energy economists, mainstream energy economists have been arguing for many years now, actually. No one's really listened to them, but they've been saying, look, the, the, the types of wholesale and retail markets we have for electricity around the world now were were designed and implemented in and for a fossil fuel world. And those types of markets are no longer appropriate given the shift to different types of electricity, specifically renewables. And the argument there will be we can we can as you know as I said earlier was we can make those markets work better. Maybe I'm you know I'm far from convinced for all sorts of the same reasons that Adrian's already already been pointing out. The other thing I would say is that those calls for reformed electricity markets reached a pitch not surprisingly during 2021 22 when europe had its its energy you know it's relatively brief energy crisis and everyone was like oh my god why are gas prices and electricity prices coupled together and what's this all about and we need to decouple them and and in both the eu and in the uk they said well we're doing these review processes we're going to reform those markets we're going to decouple them well what's happened two years later those calls just died away and eventually the EU said, we're not going to redesign the markets at all. We're just going to keep them exactly as they are, essentially. And I'm pretty pretty sure the UK will do the same thing. But one of those three things is, is necessary uh, or some kind of combination, or we're just going to be left where we are, which, which is kind of, you know, heading for um, nothing close to two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees. Adrian, don't know if you yeah. want to pick up on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, yeah, just on two points there, I think, you know, what Brett has touched on a lot with things like the electricity market is like, you could say if not the market, but in many ways, you know, how much of a market is the electricity market in many instances really, right? So we're kind of already at a position of trying to overcome the fact that markets don't work in many of these policy areas so desperately through, I think there's a quote in your book, right, which is amazing. You know, someone describes it as like a bureaucratic thicket more than a market. And I think that's so often the case when, when you have these areas of policy or, you know, crisis, <laughs> if we'll call it that, where, you know, we are trying to force markets through already to the point that they broadly don't resemble markets already. So I would sort of reframe the question there slightly. But the other would be, you know, if you were to look at something like, uh, you know, nature and then sort of ecosystems and biodiversity as we, as we touched on, you know, there we're much earlier up the line, I think, of trying to render those things market compliant. Um, and I think the answer really, if you look at the complexity of just constructing these artificial markets so that people can then trade in these things is, I think, indicative of the answer, right? Which is that at that stage, broadly, what you're already doing is regulation directly, but you're just sort of handing over the actual enactment of it to the market rather than coming out forthright and saying, these are our priorities. And so on the one hand, you have people setting those priorities from the outset. And then on the other, you kind of render them totally unaccountable and invisible by turning them into a market. And that I think is a really significant problem because ultimately, you know, these are really challenging questions. There are trade-offs between things like economic development and the environment, and those should be very open. They should be sort of democratically decided and determined and sort of discussed as such rather than kind of trying to render them invisible through through markets and kind of obfuscating what's actually happening and, and who's responsible and who's impacted. And so that I think is the kind of general approach that I take to these problems. And then the other would just be that in many instances, you know, the profit motive can deliver, as Brett talked about at the beginning, things that people like and enjoy. But when it comes to a lot of what needs to be done here, you know, the profit motive is simply not necessarily aligned with what we need to see, whether that's renewable energy, or you can look at something else like mobility and transport, right? Where in theory, the profit motive might deliver a world where we replace every single vehicle one-to-one -one with an EV. But from an ecological and quite likely a human rights standpoint, that's potentially catastrophic. Um, and so these things just often aren't aligned and, and markets are really good at sort of obfuscating that. And so that I think is, you know, where I stand now as we approach these final kind of very difficult problems is that visibility and accountability and transparency in how we deliberate over these issues is, is integral to how I would approach anything. I just want to, I want to add something to, to Adrian's first point there, because I think it's a really interesting and important point. 
uh, which, which is this issue of kind of pricing and electricity markets and the idea that and, and the fact that as adrian said we don't re- to be honest we don't really have a market in electricity as it is at least anything like a market as people typically think about it and what i want what i wanted to add to that because she's absolutely right is something that's very interesting which is that so again 2021 22 when we had huge energy price inflation in large parts of the world but particularly in europe and and other and, and also southeast asia as well but particularly in europe um and and obviously the answer from lots of economists on the left was, and rightly so, you know, we need price controls of, of some kind or another. And there was a big hoo-ha about, you know, we can't have price controls. But but with the the ironic thing, and I t- and I talk about this in the book, was the fact that if you looked at electricity, you know, long before the crisis, already over fifty percent of EU countries had price controls for electricity in place already. So the idea that like we had this kind of, you know, free market. And we need to introduce price controls to this market because the market's not working it was actually kind of a nonsense anyway, because in most places, it was a completely regulated and controlled market anyway, including in the UK. So the, it's just this m- huge mismatch between our our kind of presumptions about what markets are and, and what we have when we talk about markets and the reality, which is, which is as, as Adrian said, a bureaucratic thicket that doesn't really resemble anything like we typically think of as markets. I mean, I, I, yeah, no, thanks for that, Brett. I just wanted to, to come back also on something uh, Adrian flagged, which is th- this issue of need. And really, this is a sort of final question, which I realize is potentially quite a big one. But it's, it's, it's related to, to the sort of purpose of the economy and what it is that we might all be doing with any of this stuff anyway. I think it's implicit and and rightly so in both your books that basically like we do actually want to limit climate change and protect the environment as perfectly reasonable things to do. But there is an issue there potentially about making these things explicit and starting to think a bit more seriously about actually maybe we don't need as much as electricity in the global north as we are going to demand for all these electric vehicles that we're going to insist on putting on the road, for instance. And I'm wondering how far either of you have engaged with some of these ideas particularly around sort of the degrowth, you know, this growing movement of degrowth and the questioning of consumption and forms of consumption, as well as what we've talked about, which I think is on the production side in particular. I'll throw that open to either of you, whether you've got any sort of final thoughts around that in particular on, on the purpose of economics and how we might consume better or differently, or even if this matters greatly. Sure, sure. Um, I, you know, I have, I, for better or worse, I haven't engaged um, Directly or even really indirectly with 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 debates around degrowth, or I, although you know I'm aware of them, um, and I think and I completely understand why they're there. I mean, you only have to look, you know, when I was working on on the on the book and looking at electricity, you only have to look at the um, the huge differential in, for, for example, in per capita per capita electricity consumption. Um, across different parts of the world, and the kind of egregious levels of consumption in North North America compared, even to Europe, actually, uh, let alone you know India or ba- or Bangladesh or Nigeria, to think, you know, that this is just ridiculous. So I, t- I totally get it. However, I think you know, thinking about this more, you know, in, in less in a kind of visceral sense, but in an intellectual intellectual sense, I think for me, the, one of the reasons that I haven't engaged with this stuff, and I hope hopefully this is a decent answer to your question. Is that it? You know, if if meaningful public ownership of assets feels politically far fetched right now, which it does, then degrowth in in you know in the global north feels like I don't know what the word is for more than far fetched, but but that's the word to it. It just seems so beyond the bounds of anything like uh, political possibility. That I that I, I wouldn't go there, but but more importantly than that, I think you know, if, if you if you go to the global south and you look at the the levels of, again of electricity consumption in large parts of the of the global south, then to talk about degrowth in that context would be very very problematic. I mean, if you if you if you go if you talk to people who are working in energy sectors in the global south. And you talk about any, you know, you try to talk about the energy transition, then the typical answer will be, well, what do you mean by energy transition? We're concerned about energy access, let alone energy transition. That feels like a kind of conceit imported from, from the global north, where you know hundreds of hundreds of millions of homes don't even have access to electricity. Um, and 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 so again, it feels very, it, it feels it feels very 
um, odd in that complex to be talking about things like that. And let's be clear, and, and, and I think this is something I probably, if, if there's one, you know, thing that I would want people to take away more than anything else, actually, from the, from the book I've written, it's, it is the fact that this is ultimately about the global south rather than the global north in terms of the, the future of kind of power sector and emissions. Um, you know, while we tend to talk, the likes of us tend to talk a lot about what's happening in Europe and the US, what happens in Europe and US will be relatively peripheral to, to, to the future of the planet in terms of those emissions for, for two main reasons. One of which is obviously that, um, you know, future expected growth in energy production and consumption is is largely concentrated outside the West. Um, you know, it's largely concentrated in places where per capita consumption is currently very, very low. Um, and then the other reason, which is that, you know, while we like to beat up what we, what we do in places like Europe and some, the, the energy transition is actually relatively far advanced in, in Europe compared to in many other parts of the world. You know, in South Africa, 90% of power generation is still coal, 75% in India, it's 65%, I think it was in China in 2022. And so it's, it's, it's those parts of the world where, A, you're going to have huge growth in energy consumption and where energy production is currently very, very fossil fuel heavy, that it's going to make the real differences. And here's the thing, that's where the profitability challenges for new renewables development are greatest, because the cost of financing us in particular are so, so high that, that there's no development you know, outside of China going on right now because people can't make money out of it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Brett makes a lot of very compelling points there. I mean, this is one of those questions that always you end up feeling as though we just are a sort of rock hard place really when it comes to I guess the kind of like economic and political realities of, of what we're up against which I think Brett articulated really well there versus you know if you if you do look at the evidence that we have to date and you know this can change there's no reason that the future necessarily will replicate the past but all evidence that we have to date suggests that you know decoupling of carbon emissions or of kind of material impact, depending on how you want to measure that in terms of sort of extractive industries or sort of environmental kind of degradation, et cetera, you know, evidence that those can be sort of decoupled from growth as measured by GDP is really weak, you know, even in places like the UK, which is often held up as kind of the best indicator of, of decoupling emissions uh, from growth, um, at least when I'm speaking there in the absolute sense, right? So that's, it's one thing for carbon emissions to grow more slowly than, than GDP growth. It's another altogether to kind of break that relationship in, in absolute terms. And that is kind of something that will be necessary, right? If you just think about how we actually reach a kind of global global net zero. And so that's kind of this, as it stands, undeniable scientific fact that we're up against. Um, I think that that is no less real than the kind of political and economic constraints that, that Brett has articulated. Um, and so I guess the way that I try to reconcile that, and you know, this doesn't necessarily lead us to some kind of ideal, well-articulated solution, but I think there's something to the question you know, of degrowth where, degrowth in what, degrowth for who, you know, I think this does matter. We treat it as this kind of like aggregate indicator that I think replicates the same problem with using GDP as an indicator in the first place, right? It tells us very little about how we're meeting human needs, about material conditions, about our ecological and, and climatic impact. Um, and so I think kind of jettisoning that as a priority and as an indicator and really as something that we pay attention to is, is a very basic starting point. I would say that there are lots of things that do need to degrow, to use that term. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. <laughs> I think there's a lot of ways that we organize and distribute sort of wealth and consumption and production and economies globally and, you know, domestically within somewhere like the UK that aren't optimal for, for most people's well-being, that are incredibly unjust, that don't serve many people. You know, we have kind of record rates of poverty in the UK right now among children. You know, it's hard to say that that's a functioning economy even when it's growing. And so I think, you know, what the trick will be, if it's a trick, is really a sort of... <laughs> 
focus on discrete priorities rather than this question of growth. And ultimately, that will come down, I think, to a question of significant kind of redistribution of you know, wealth and income as we see it in society. That's obviously a major political challenge, but it's so intimately tied up with our sort of carbon emissions, with our impact on the environment, and with so many other kind of economic outcomes, whether it's sort of like health, education, well-being, this phenomenal inequality with which we define our current economy is ultimately where I think we need to begin from a point of more radical change. And I think that's often what people speaking about degrowth are actually talking about. I think it's often unfairly kind of maligned because of the the terminology used. But that is a really complex question. Um, But that, I think, is how I tend to try to sort of resolve that kind of rock hard place tension is is in what, for what, for whom, where are we growing or degrowing and, and begin from there.